So have I ever told you uh, about the time that the gospel made me a uh, intolerant jerk? I had a profound experience of God's grace for me. I got, like not uh, head knowledge, not verse of scripture able to quote, but got from here to here that my value to God did not come from my behavior, from my choices, from my religious activities. I got that God loved me no, no matter what. My picture of God, uh, that image that we all have in the back of our mind of, of who it is we think that we are and how God relates to us, my picture of God, it shifted radically. But in almost the next breath, I started to feel sorry for those people who didn't uh, know what I knew. And by feel sorry for what I mean is judge. This understanding that I had that was giving me life quickly became a way for me to elevate myself. How insightful that is, the stuff I found in the Bible that totally proves them wrong. So wise. Not like, not like those poor people. You ever said that? Uh, breastfeeding moms say it about moms who use formula. Vegetarians say it about people who eat meat. Hybrid drivers say it about people with SUVs, and SUV drivers say it right back uh, to the hybrid drivers. There's uh, you know Mac and Windows users, and iPhone and Android users, and Calvinists versus Armenian theologians, and Christians versus the atheists. This is what we do, right? We make tribes. Who is in with us? Who's out? Who's acceptable? Who's not acceptable? Who's worthy of our charity? Who's not? This is what we do. And as soon as we're clear on what the tribes are, then our own sort of desperate need to prove our value kicks in. And so not only do we have a tribe, but our tribe is better than everyone else's tribe. And in order to prove that to ourselves, we have to take the other tribe down. Take off the old, renew the mind, put on the new. This is not a one-time process. The story that we've told in Christianity to our detriment is that God changes you all at once and you're just changed, boom. And sometimes there are people who have aspects of their lives changed miraculously. But the truth is that for our whole life, the process of transformation happens over time, over time through this cycle of taking off the old, renewing the mind, trying on the new. You're not gonna move smoothly through this process until you arrive at some grand destination of spiritual maturity. We have to stop as a church thinking about spiritual growth being a hard uphill mountain climb until we arrive. Now that is because when we think that way and then we look at the state of our lives, we decide that either change doesn't work or it's not working in us, there's something wrong with us and that's why we have to. That's why it's so common in churches for us to pretend about where we're at and to not be vulnerable and not tell the truth because we want to be on this climb, right? We want to be somewhere on this. And for goodness sake, we've been Christians for 25 years now. We really shouldn't be at base camp still. But when we live from a place where we are driven to find our security or our happiness or a sense of safety or value in the stuff that we have, here's what happens. We are restricted from having freedom. We're restricted from having free and open relationships with others. We're restricted from experiencing the moment that we have as abundant. When I was working 80 hours a week and not ever taking time off, I still felt like I didn't have enough time. And when I was working 40 hours a week and guarding the boundaries of my life very carefully, I felt like I didn't have enough time. And when I was on sabbatical with absolutely no official responsibilities, I felt like I didn't have enough time. And that taught me something really important. That feeling had nothing to do with my to-do lists or my efforts. That feeling was something about me, something about my heart, a feeling that I just hadn't done enough. Maybe, maybe you can relate to that. In the cover of an old Bible that I have on my bookcase at home that belonged to my dad, I found these words on the cover panel in his handwriting. We must learn what we mean to God before we can discover what he wants us to do. God loves you by name. You matter to the Father. That's why Jesus died for you. If this is true, it means that you can stop living to the Father. This is what Galatians 2, 19-20 means. It says we live 
the life we live in the flesh, we live by trusting Jesus. That means not by trusting our own good deeds. Not by believing that we believe enough, by trusting in the strength of our faith, or trusting that we have accomplished something significant in the world that should make others or God notice us. Because when we are trusting in those things, we are trying to establish our own sense of value. We're trying to build up our own walls of security or create our own belonging. We're trying to force our seat at the cool kid's table. And you know what? That's the reason why those moments you remember today when you stood up at the beginning of this message, that's why those moments were so crushing. Because they weren't about the boyfriend or the job or the sports team. They were about the desperate ache in your heart to know that you are valued, that you are safe, that you belong. And those things, feeling valued, feeling safe, belonging, they are just the practical experience of being loved. We are desperate to know that we are loved.